everyone, welcome back to the NFA Review Channel. Today's video is gonna be a little different than what you're used to seeing on my channel. So in lieu of doing a product review video, I wanted to do just a basic informational video on suppressors. Because every single day I get emails, PMs, and DMs on basic questions to advanced questions on suppressors. So I wanted to create a video that's gonna be a one-stop shop, very clear and concise. I'm gonna to try to get this thing rolling nice and smooth. And we're going to cover basically everything from the history of the first suppressor to how they work, to how the assemblies work, to what they're made from, to why you use them, stuff like that. So whether you're a, a uh, novice in the suppressor world or you've been around them for a couple years, hopefully this video will kind of touch base on enough so everybody can learn something today. So I never script my video, guys. Uh, best I, I script for my other videos is I have a whiteboard there behind the camera that I jot down some specifications on so I don't forget anything. Um, now, this video, I really wanted to get into the nit and gritty and cover everything. So I sat down and just downloaded my brain and I come up with seven pages of information here. So uh, I'm gonna try to make this flow as quickly as possible. Like I said, I'm gonna be using a ton of B-roll here for today's video uh, because I found if you have a visual aid, you'll actually learn and retain the information that you're hearing. So. Let's uh, give it a shot. Hopefully uh, this goes off well and this becomes a video that you guys out there can pass on to friends and family that have their own questions about suppressors. Let's get to it. All right, starting from the very beginning. The suppressor was invented by Haram Percy Maxim in 1902 and patented in 1908. Uh, his father, Sir Haram Maxim, uh, was credited with inventing the Maxim machine gun. So inventing uh, pretty badass uh, devices is uh, definitely ran in the, f in the family blood. The muffler actually for combustion engines was also developed in parallel with the firearm silencer by Maxim in the early 20th century. Uh, using many of the same techniques to provide quieter running engines and in many English-speaking countries, our automobile mufflers were called silencers, uh, which is why I use the argument, you know, why is it socially acceptable for a gun to be loud and a car to be quiet? You know, if you flip the script on it, how annoying would it be to hear cars all the time without a muffler on it, which is straight pipes versus a gun when you shoot it, it's quiet. Why is it so socially unacceptable to have a quiet gun? Well. Certainly we can blame Hollywood for that, but uh, let's not talk about Hollywood any more than we have to. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, for the purpose of today's video, uh, suppressor, silencer, can, sound moderator, uh, they all have the same meaning and reference. Uh, you can actually use the term suppressor and silencer interchangeably. Uh, anybody who says otherwise, they're simply wrong. Uh, the inventor, named it a silencer, and the ATF's paperwork on all the approved silencers that I have states silencer. Uh, suppressor is just another slang term for it. Now, silencers have been used throughout history since 1902 to protect the hearing of sports shooters, farmers, uh, military, stuff like that. Um, all the way dating back to the original Maxim moderator, his first suppressor, uh, the well rod from World War II. And uh, now we enjoy them uh, every day on a daily basis on a commercial scale. But let's go ahead and get to the details on what is happening when you discharge a firearm and how a suppressor, sorry, silencer works. When a firearm is discharged, you have a couple things going on. You have uh, the muzzle blast, okay, a bullet flight, bullet impact, the noise of the action itself, and of course the familiar sound of a casing hitting the ground. But let's explore a little deeper here. The main sound generated when firing a, a gun is the uh, uncorking effect of the high temperature and high pressure gas escaping into the atmosphere as a bullet leaves the muzzle. Think of this as uh, the uncorking effect of a champagne bottle. Um, the second problematic sound is the supersonic crack from the projectile breaking the sound barrier. And of course, this is only overcome by the use of subsonic cartridges in certain applications. Uh, and then you have the less noticeable sound to the untrained ear, like the uh, 
the loud crack or thud, depending on the impact surface type, uh, of the projectile depositing, right, its kinetic energy into that object. Um, and then finally, other noises, like I mentioned earlier, of the distinct differences between a metal on metal action noise versus a metal on polymer action noise, right? A little duller and stuff like that. So all these sounds are usually overshadowed by that loud uncorking effect of the gunshot and you can't normally hear them. Well, when you're shooting with a suppressor, uh, they all become very clear on just how loud they are in themselves. So the main goal again with a suppressor is to eliminate that instant uncorking effect into the atmosphere, right? Uh, so think of this as associated with letting out the tire pressure on your overinflated car tire. If you push on that center valve stem slowly, you hear a little hiss, not much sound, and the air gets let out slow. If you push too hard, too abruptly into that center stem, it's gonna be very loud and you're gonna let the air out too fast. Well, the same thing goes for a suppressor. What your ears perceive as sound is the pressure change in your ear canal. So uh, the less pressure exerted into the atmosphere and the space you're currently occupying, the less noisy it will be to you. So again, with a silencer, we're slowing down those gases and letting them expand before they exit, just like you would slowly let the air out of an overinflated car tire. Make sense? Now, OSHA states that you have irreversible permanent hearing damage uh, with the gunshot because 140 dB is a cutoff. So OSHA states 140 decibels at that threshold. Anything at that or over that, you will, you will succumb to immediate hearing loss. Now, hearing loss is accumulative. So if you have a lot of 130 decibel sounds going off all the time, you're going to slowly lose your hearing over time anyway. Uh, so you definitely, you want to protect your hearing at all costs. And while DB recordings can't be accurately recorded with a uh, little cheap app on your cell phone, uh, they can be recorded with, you know, a very sophisticated, uh, costly, and uh, calibrated meter. Um, I don't personally have one. I work with a lot of companies that have their own. Like I said, they're very expensive. And uh, these days, numbers aren't everything. Uh, you know, back in... The early 2000s, you had some companies that were trying to fudge numbers on how their cam performed because there was nobody like me around. Uh, YouTube wasn't really big back then. People were just really getting into suppressors. They were just now becoming mainstream. Um, so nowadays, the suppressor manufacturers know they can't really fudge the numbers. And if you're not new to my channel, you know that I mainly focus on the tone of the can because that's really what's going to, you know, all the suppressors these days are hearing safe for the most part some are actually and sound insanely good they're very safe for your ears so really it comes down to tone what do you like high pitch frequency or low pitch frequency uh, low pitch sounds much like a subwoofer in a car are gonna uh, be more pleasing to the ear but because the frequencies lower it can actually carry on over time and distance further than a higher pitch tone now higher pitch tone to my ears and most people's ears is annoying but the frequency peak drops off quickly over time and distance. Uh, that's why you can hear a, a subwoofer a mile away versus the highs. That's why that works. So uh, as far as my channel, I care more about tone than I do sitting around metering cans all day. Now a typical Glock 19, let's use for an example, this gun is unloaded, uh, meters at about 160 decibels. So one shot fired from this, you've already ruined your hearing. Now, a top of line suppressor for this same gun, uh, pretty much king of suppression right now in the nine millimeter world. It's gonna be the CGS Group Kraken, S, or, uh, Kraken 9. I've already done a review on that. I mean, that thing's metering at like 119 decibels, which is crazy. Um, as a reference point, the bolt shutting, okay, closing on the chamber with a loaded magazine, so loading a live round into the chamber on an AR-15, is 112 decibels. That with subsonic ammunition is 119, so very quiet. Now, some suppressors do better at the muzzle when they get metered versus the ejection port. So you've probably seen out there in your research companies say at ear metering or at muzzle metering. Well, the military standard is at muzzle, but nowadays we're starting to kind of drift apart that in the commercial 
segment and a lot of companies are either gathering both or they're gathering the ad ear because that's more important really. Um, I'm the one shooting the gun, I need my ears protected. Or if you're an onlooker from a couple feet away, it's not gonna make a difference anyway what it meters at at the muzzle. Um, the reason there's a difference is because there's a fine line here with being too good, if that makes any sense. So if this is really corked up and it really lowers that pressure in here, really restricts it before it exits and hits the atmosphere, then chances are you're gonna get a lot of back pressure when you're shooting. So when that breech unlocks, you're gonna get a lot of back pressure coming back out that barrel in the form of unburnt gunpowder granules and uh, gas pressure in your face and sound. So there's a really fine formula there for getting it just right. Uh, that can definitely does it. This is the old AAC Tyrant 9. Uh, actually, for being as old as it is, it's a, uh, it's a great can. It sounds really good. Uh, it's just not as uh, easy to clean. All right, now that we have all that out of the way, let's go ahead and cover what the suppressor itself consists of. So they're all going to be pretty much the same design as far as a muzzle-mounted can. You're going to have an area where it attaches to the firearm, a booster assembly or not, the baffle stack, be it uh, baffles individual or a monocore, the tube, and then an end cap. So starting from front to back, we're going to have a direct thread. That's going to be your most common uh, weight amount of firearm, especially to a handgun. This is the most common, and direct thread is exactly that. You have a female portion on the suppressor that mates with a male thread portion of your host firearm. Screw it on, secure it, and you're good to go. Uh, there's other ways to attach it as well, uh, QD or quick detach. Uh, we'll pull this one off here. This is a CMMG can I just did a review on not too long ago. Quick detach. You're going to have you know, your normal threaded barrel and then your QD attachment system that's proprietary that comes with a suppressor mounts to your gun and then its mounting interface mounts with the back of the suppressor. So it's a lot quicker then screwing on a half inch long thread onto a host and it's secure and it will not loosen under heavy firing schedules like full auto stuff like that. So those are your main two, direct thread and QD. Let's discuss why you have to use certain mounting surfaces. So you have two different types of barrels out there that you're gonna come across when shooting suppressed and different variables you're gonna have to overcome. So. When shooting on a handgun, you have a browning type action, right? On most of these guns, save for the Beretta. Um, meaning it's a, the barrel has to tilt up to unlock so the action can operate properly. Well, if you add a suppressor, which is weight, to the end of the barrel, that's going to impede that firearm's ability to properly cycle. So in these, you have a device called a Nielsen device or a booster. What that essentially does is boost the recoil. That's <laughs> exactly what it sounds like. So how it works is you, you have a couple components here that make up the booster no matter what the brand. You have a piston, which is your threaded adapter that threads to your host gun. Around that on the inside, you have a spring that sits in the blast chamber. And what happens is when you shoot the gun, the gas pressure behind the bullet goes into the first section of the suppressor and pulls it forward. I'll demonstrate here how you can see the can actually moves forward itself. When that spring compresses, it allows the barrel to free float and unlock from the frame. At the end of the recoil cycle, that spring rebounds back and then the slide snaps forward, the gun relocks and you're ready to fire again. That's why when you're shooting um, a suppressed firearm, many of you that have tried it already know that it has a really lobby feeling to it. You know, it's the recoil impulse is not normal. It's not snappy, it's kind of delayed. And that's exactly what you're feeling is that movement of the booster assembly cycling back and forth. Again, if that was a fixed mounting system without a booster, the gun would just be, a, it would fail to work properly. It would essentially be a uh, single shot firearm. You would have to manually rack the slide each time. Now on a fixed barrel, very different. You do not ever use a booster assembly on a fixed barrel because it would literally jackhammer the can back and forth because there's nothing, there's no barrel moving with it. The barrel's stationary, right? So you'll jackhammer your threads to hell on it. Now, on a fixed barrel, 
you don't need a booster assembly either qd or if this wasn't here and you had a direct thread suppressor you can just mount this right to it and it'd be fine without a booster assembly at all you just have to check if it's direct thread to make sure that the can is not loosening in between magazines now circling back to a suppressor that has a booster on a handgun anytime you add a weight to the end of a barrel be it a pistol or a rifle you can change the point of impact and that's due to a couple factors. Uh, you have barrel harmonics and the gas and cross jetting happening behind the projectile as it leaves. Anytime you have a pressure differential behind a projectile or the base of the projectile, you can, you can change things. Um, so on a handgun, just by putting this on here, I might change my point of impact by an inch, an inch down, an inch right, let's say. And when I take it off, it shoots back to where it should. Well, what you can do is because of the orientation of the baffles inside the suppressor, you can actually pull forward on the suppressor itself, rotate it, and you can actually clock the suppressor to a different location. Now you can do this as many times as there is splines on the piston on the inside. Okay, so you can actually fine tune it like a clock to where you know exactly where this gun's gonna shoot with the suppressor mounted. Now, on a rifle, it is not that easy. Uh, there are some that are clockable, but the majority are set and forget it. So, uh, we can use this, for example, even though it's a SBR. So, the Sig Sauer MCX 300 Blackout here. Um, I didn't really find any point of impact change on this, but let's say we did. The reason it's happening is because if you look at a barrel, at a um, rifle when it's shot under high-speed film, the barrel itself actually is whipping, okay? So anytime you add a weight to the end of the barrel, you're gonna change the harmonics of the barrel and you can change the, the point of impact of the projectile itself. So that's why you see those uh, bench rest shooters sometimes, they have those weights, those rubber weights, and they slide it over the barrel. They're tuning the barrel and finding the right harmonics uh, to squeeze as most accuracy out of the gun as it can. Now, the name of the game here in the suppressor world is repeatability. I don't care if it shifts my point of impact, as long as the next time I put the suppressor on, I know exactly how to adjust my scope to be right where I need it. So all the modern cans today have pretty minimal point of impact shift. And even if they are, you can repeat the adjustments to hit the point of aim. All right, now let's move into the suppressor itself. In the tube, if we have the baffles or the monocore stack that I have been referencing, um, that's the part that's actually doing the work. The baffles allow the gas to slow uh, cross jet in many cases and cool down before it exits the front cap and exits the suppressor. Now uh, some modern and common baffle types are K, uh, M, Omega. These can be machined from aluminum, uh, heat treated uh, 174 stainless, uh, titanium, Inconel 718, uh, Stellite, M300, merging alloy. Uh, these are all very uh, premium metals that could be used uh, to machine the baffle stack. Now, you have those baffles that are individual baffles that stack together and slide inside the tube or a mono core. And it means exactly that, it's one core. So instead of having individual baffles that stack up, it's one solid piece of said material that they machine with a series of chambers in it that slides into the tube. Now, each one of those kind of has their own pros and cons. Um, let's use K baffles for example. The K baffle is high volume, uh, but it has a slow gas flow path. Uh, that's because of the, the, the mouse holes and the cross jetting effect inside the K baffle. Again, high volume, low gas flow path. Uh, so generally you don't get first round pop. So if you've ever seen the acronym FRP on the forum or in a discussion area underneath one of my videos, FRP stands for first round pop. First round pop is a phenomenon where the uh, available oxygen inside a suppressor on the first round fired is ignited by that first shot and it burns a little longer. So the, the first report is usually louder. And then subsequent shots are quieter because you've replaced that oxygen with gun smoke. There's no more O2 inside the suppressor. It's much quieter. K baffles don't really have that issue because by the time that that ignited gas gets to the front of the can, it's already slowed down enough. Monocore is a little different. While they might be easier to clean than a K baffle, uh, it's 
high volume but high gas flow path. So usually you get a louder first round pop on that first shot. Um, and another pros and cons are uh, to not really the baffles but the material are the metals. So as far as ease of cleaning, you've probably heard cleaning with ultrasonic cleaners. I'm gonna go ahead and simplify it. If it's not stainless steel, don't put it in there. If it's painted, don't put it in there. Anodized, don't put it in there. It will ruin everything. Stainless steel, bare metal parts only. So no titanium, no aluminum, it will cavitate them. It might not look like it's damaging your part, but if you do it over and over again, it's actually cavitating the metal on a microscopic level and it will damage it. Um, so I usually just hand clean my suppressors. All right, now moving back to the first round pop issue. Uh, one way to negate first, uh, first round pop is by shooting the suppressor wet. Now you probably heard that a lot on my channel. Uh, some of you have asked that question weekly on what that means, and it means exactly that. By um, uh, older cans had to use some sort of ablative to assist in suppression. So this additive forces the consumption of energy inside the suppressor and it displaces the oxygen, which will get rid of first round pop. So anytime you're making the suppressor do more work in here, the less you're gonna get out here. Some common ways to shoot it wet is a uh, one to two cc's of wire pulling gel, water-based only, don't use the lax-based stuff. Water, spit, whatever drink you're drinking that day. Gun oil is hit or miss. If it's flammable, it makes it louder. Stuff like that. Uh, there's a lot of snake oil crap out there about making your suppressor quieter. I just use water because when you're using water, it's gonna convert to steam more readily than all the other products, right? And converting to steam is a good way to consume energy inside a suppressor. And when it's converting to steam, you're taking the surface area of one drop of water, increasing it to 1700 times its size. So you're displacing any available air inside the suppressor on that first shot. As soon as that heat from that first round fired enters that can, boom, steam, you're gonna actually see a lot of steam jet out the front and the report can be sometimes cut down by 20 decibels. I mean, it's, it can really turn a quiet can into a, did it, did it shoot? I mean, it's that quiet. Uh, drawback when shooting wet. Clean up after the fact, because there's water everywhere in your gun, especially. And uh, your face. Sometimes you guys see me shooting and when I do my ending thoughts, I'm talking to the camera, I got peppering on my face. Well, that's from shooting it wet. And anytime you add water to a suppressor, nothing happens, like we did with the Kraken 9. It's basically as efficient as it could possibly be because there was no change in suppression. So that's one way to find out. Another phenomenon other than first round pop is called free bore boost. Now, I haven't confirmed it myself. It's actually a video that I'm looking forward to doing. I've been wanting to do it for a couple of years now and I'm gonna finally do it. So what free bore boost is, is the added effect of adding velocity to the projectile when you're adding a suppressor. So you're basically extending the barrel. So if we look at this gun, this little 22 here. Think of this as not only an expansion chamber and quieting the report, but it's also allowing that gunpowder to burn a little bit longer. And anytime you have that time and energy on the back of that projectile, just a fraction of a second longer, it's gonna propel it more. So the theory is that on, uh, I don't know about pistols, which we will test, but on rifles, you can increase the velocity by adding a suppressor by 50 to 150 feet per second, which doesn't sound like much, but it is something, which is funny because in the video games, it actually decreases your feet per second, which I always thought was funny. So I will do a video one day where I have a chronograph and we'll do some unsuppressed scenes with various guns and then we'll throw the suppressor on and see what we find. Uh, so that's free bore boost if you've ever heard that term. Now, in addition to the muzzle mounted cans that we've already discussed, we have integral. So integrals are exactly that. The suppressor itself is integral to the host firearm. So it's built in one piece. I did a review on this one. This is the um, TBA suppressor Sicario. So I actually did a fun little uh, entry or uh, intro scene to this suppressor that paid homage to the uh, the Sicario franchise movie. It's just a funny little scene I did. Uh, super quiet. The suppressor itself is built in to the barrel. 
Uh, so you can't even tell that this is suppressed at first glance. Another benefit of doing an integral is you're able to port the barrel. So probably wondering why you would want to port the barrel and bleed your velocity. Well, if you wanted to shoot cheap bulk pack high velocity ammo through a 22 instead of the more expensive subsonic rounds, have your barrel ported. Now you're gonna bleed some of the pressure before it leaves its muzzle and then enters a suppressor and you can shoot more affordably. Uh, I've done reviews on integrals. It's not, I haven't done a bunch of them because uh, mainly you guys want to see the muzzle cans. I think the last rifle one I did was for Ruger. Their ISP had things like uber quiet. You need to check out that review if you haven't already. Um, so in short, integrals are really cool. They're not really for uh, newbies to the market, I would say, because they're not that versatile. I mean, you're, you get it and you're stuck with it. You can't take this suppressor off and move it onto a rifle, so on and so forth. Um, actually, this one you can. They have an adapter for it, but that's like the only gun I know that has that ability. So check out that video if you haven't already. Moving on, in addition to the technology we've already covered, we have some old technology to discuss, wipes. So you probably heard the term wipe. Uh, it's been coming up really recent on one of the last videos I, I've done, the Energetic Armament Vox. Uh, this suppressor video went crazy over the last couple of days. It's getting like 9,000 views an hour uh, with a lot of questions on wipes. So hopefully they'll see this video. Wipe is basically a reinforced neoprene rubber disc that goes inside the suppressor and acts as a baffle. Well, back in the 80s, they didn't have fancy pants machined K baffles made out of titanium. Um, they had a series of rubber discs inside a tube and the bullet would go through it and it would trap and reseal the gas. They were actually really effective because they would literally seal the gas tight because the bullet would go through it and it would just peel around the bullet and then close off, trapping the gas inside each chamber versus these, the gas will flow out. But these last a lifetime, the wipes lasted 100, 200 rounds tops. Well, back in the 80s, it was no big deal because a wipe was not a regulated suppressor part like it is now. Hell, even a couple of years ago, you could just buy a sheet of that wipe material from, Mick, from McMaster Car, get a punch and just make your own wipes and as you shot them out, you could replace them. Uh, these days, the ATF says you can't do that. So the only way to do it is to be, go to your dealer and just exchange a wipe. He's allowed to exchange a used wipe with you so you don't have an extra suppressor part. It is stupid but it is what it is. Now that old technology is starting to mesh with the new technology. I just referenced the Vox can, uh, the Dead Air Ghost, and I have the Thompson Machine Wasp. All three of those cans that I have are taking their new tech and adding a wipe to the end cap system. So it's an optional thing. You don't have to do it. You can add a wipe to the end cap and it acts as one last chamber to seal that gas as the bullet leaves the suppressor. And uh, they work really well. Like I said, it's a, it's a wear item, but if you have a system with your local dealer, you can just stop by every once in a while, switch it out. It's not a big deal. Knowing the flip-flop in ATF, they're probably going to reverse the decision in the next year anyway. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Now that you guys pretty much have a rundown of all the technical aspects of suppressors, let's cover why they're regulated and when that happened. So back on June 26, 1934, Congress enacted the NFA or National Firearms Act. Uh, so now you know what my channel stands for. Uh, this act broke up guns into two groups. You have Title I and Title II. So Title I are all guns that you guys are already used to buying at your gun shop. Normal pistols, revolvers, rifles with barrels of 16 inches or more, shotguns with barrels of 18 inches or more. And then with Title II, you have all the cool fun stuff that we like to play with. Silencers, short barrel rifles, short barrel shotguns, AOWs, destructive devices, machine guns, anything else I forgot in there. So all the cool stuff. Uh, those were all restricted. Well, it was unconstitutional to outright ban stuff, especially in the 30s. They weren't going to try to pull that crap. Uh, so they enacted a tax on it. Well, why were they enacting a tax on it, you might ask? We can all think the gangster movies we all love watching these days, those bastards ruined it for us. So with the massacres in the streets, with the Thompson, that you could buy a Thompson machine gun, I think, if my history is correct, for like $27 at Sears back in the 30s, full auto. Uh, so we can blame the gangsters for murdering each other in the streets every day for that. Uh, so overnight, $200 tax on this item, holy crap, 
that was a lot of money back then. Uh, the, the average Joe Schmo back then made $1,900 a year. A freaking car was $650 for the car. So you're asking him to pay today's price is equivalent with inflation accounted for of $3,600 to buy a suppressor. That's crazy. Listen, I love my cans and stuff, but there ain't no way in hell I'm paying a $3,600 tax stamp on it. So thank God Uncle Sam screwed up and uh, there was no uh, inflation adjustment written into the law. So 200 days today, while sucks, it's not the end of the world. It's not going to stop us from owning what we want. And as far as owning them today, I uh, believe off the top of my head, they are legal in 42 states. So only eight states are anti-constitutional douchebags. So um, for an updated list, you can probably check out the American Suppressor Association. I think they usually have a, uh, a graph of the United States and it shows what's legal and where it's legal and, and stuff like that. So you can keep up on it because uh, this video is going to become old. The information in it, while well, most of it's going to maintain the same, um, you know, laws change every day. So as far as buying it, that's going to be the last part of today's video. So to purchase a suppressor in one of those states, you've probably heard the term uh, form, form 4, Form 3, Form 2, Form 1. Uh, so let's cover really briefly what each form is. So starting from the bottom, uh, Form 1 is an individual's manufacture of a suppressor or short barrel shotgun or short barrel rifle, stuff like that. But since the topic of today is suppressors, we're going to stick to that. So let's say you want to make your own suppressor. Uh, you, you think you can do it better than any of these companies that have millions of dollars worth of R&D. Uh, and you want to make your own. So basically you take a Form 4, which is your standard, it's a tax form for the ATF, and you fill out all the information on it with some crude plans on what you plan to do. Nine months later it gets approved and you can make that silencer. Totally legal. You paid the $200 tax stamp on it. Moving up, Form 2 is a notification of a manufacturer that they created something. Okay, The ATF wants to track all of these. So uh, let's use rugged suppressors for example. They uh, make a new Oculus 22. They send a form to the ATF and on that form it has the specifications of the suppressor, serial number, their information, their dealer license info, stuff like that, and where it's going to be stored. The ATF then, because a new suppressor was born, inputs that into the system. Now, usually what happens is they will send a Form 3 with it because a distributor bought it. So a Form 3 is a tax-free dealer-to-dealer transfer form. So in our case, when we're buying it, we're paying a tax on it because we're an individual. In their case, their annual licensing fees pay for this already, so there's no $200 tax stamp exchanging hands here. On a Form 3, it's just dealer-to-dealer. -dealer. So let's say they sent that Form 2 in. Again, usually they send a Form 3 with it to not waste time so it gets approved quickly. So they send, uh, let's say, RSR Group. Let's say they bought 2,000 units. So they'll still send the ATF uh, a Form 3 with, I don't know how many slots are on it on one page, but 2,000 Form 2s and 2,000 Form 3s for the Oculus 22. And on that form, it's basically saying, this suppressor owned by a rugged is now being transferred to the RSR uh, FFL info. Well, whatever their license number is, that's where it's going. And the ATF, after they take that newborn suppressor and put it into the system on the Form 2, they'll go over and put it on a Form 3 being transferred from rugged to the RSR distributor, which is one of the major distributors for the United States where most of your guns in your local gun shops come from. So then, now, Rugged can ship them all in a box to RSR. Now it gets to RSR, they log it in, put it on their shelf. Now you drive your happy ass over to the dealer, you just watch the review on the Oculus, you have to have that can, you go to your dealer, and you're like, I want this can, and he explains the whole process to you, and it just like kicks you right between the legs. You can't believe you gotta wait nine months for this. Stay tuned, it's not that big of a deal. I'll walk you through the process really quick. So. In a nutshell, you pay him the full funds for the suppressor, and then he starts what's called a Form 4. So now he's taking ownership of the suppressor on the Form 4 and transferring it into your 
your individual name or a firearm trust. So again, go to the ATF. This time, you have to send a copy of your trust if you're going that route. The Form 4 documentation, a check for $200, fingerprints, and photos. All that goes to the ATF. They cash that check right away, bet your ass, and then your paperwork sits in a folder for the next nine months until an examiner walks his happy butt over there, picks up the cardboard box that it's in in a cubicle in a office building. You can't make this up. This is government. And they open it up. And by the time they actually get your paperwork in front of their face, they just verify that your trust is in order, their license is in order, and you have no background red flags. Boom, stamp approval, put a $200 tax stamp on it, sign it, and they mail that form to your dealer. Once the form four gets to your dealer, he calls you, hey, the suppressor is now transferred to you, come pick it up. It takes about nine months at the filming of this video. So that's form one through form four. There are other forms you guys really don't need to know about. Those are the basic ones. So you have suppressor birth, suppressor transfer to individual transfer. So um, again, I hope today's video I know I'm trying to get through it quickly. I'm trying to explain things as clear and concise as I can to really wrap your brains on, on how these work, how they mount, how the actions operate, and uh, more importantly, why you should go pick up one of your own. And if you don't have any experience with them and you wanna hear one in person, I work with these companies and I host two annual shooting events every year. Uh, the next one coming up is Suppressed Fest, so you can go to SuppressedFest.com and read about it. You can even RSVP on there for a chance to win a VIP package. I'm not going to use your email for spam, it's just to send you info about the uh, shoots in case Facebook puts the kibosh on all our gun pages and screws us over. At least I'll have a backup plan, and so will you the next time I have an event, which after Suppressed Fest should be uh, in March of 2019. So. Again, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Uh, I will be giving away the uh, Vox, actually the, not this one, but I have one in my safe, the one I actually used in the video. I'm giving that away on my Patreon on October 12th. And then I'm filming again with uh, Energetic Armament soon, and then I'm gonna give away another suppressor from them, the uh, NYX Mod 2, their 22 modular can, so. A lot of good things going on on Patreon. Uh, only sign up if you feel it's something that brings value to you, if you want to help support the channel. I'm trying to like reward the hell out of you guys for it, uh, doing the best I can with all the gift cards and the suppressor giveaways and stuff. But again, I'll only do it if you believe in the channel and what we're trying to do here. Um, so please uh, click that subscribe button, click the like button if you liked today's video and check that notification bell so you don't miss any further video annou announcements down the road. Uh, until then, I'll see you next time.